Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to welcome you to tonight's world premiere for performance of Jill Trent Science Sleuth. Before we begin, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. Flash photography is not permitted as the flash bulbs fall on the floor and break, leaving glass all over. During tonight's performance, there will be a lot of gunfire. Please be advised that the cap guns will not really harm anyone. However, if you are startled, you may exit the theater where you came in or these two exit doors in front of you. Finally, I understand that many of you possess magic telecommunication machines you use to com communicate with each other. Please turn them off as their use is disrespectful to the actors and annoying to those around you. Now sit back and prepare yourself as we step back in time to, to when the good were good, the bad were bad, and justice prevailed. Jill Trent Science Sleuth. It's a typical midsummer day in 1943. America is at war in a large American city which she calls home. Career girl Daisy Smith has just hailed a taxi cab. Where to, lady? East 57th Maple, please. Great iron building. I've got a job interview in 25 minutes. I do hope you can get me there in time. You know, nah, forget I brought it up. What? What were you going to say? You sure? Yes. I was going to say that if you wanted to be sure to be there on time, maybe you should have left home a little earlier. Yes, I suppose I should have. It's simple arithmetic, something that you females never seem to understand, between the hair, the makeup, and then trying out 12 pairs of shoes before finally making up your mind. It doesn't take a genius to realize that you're always going to be running late. Which is ironic since I'm a certified scientific genius. You see what I mean? And it's all entirely preventable. How come you girls never stop once to think about these things? Oh dear. Another red light? I'll tell you why. It's because girls don't have the analytical brains like men do. We are different creatures, I guess. Entirely different creatures. So what kind of job are you apply for, doll? Oh, it's nothing, really. There's an opening in the for big, bad, and ugly. Oh, we're crying out loud. Holy oh, Toledo, what's going on? We're in the middle of a gun battle, and here I was having such a nice, peaceful Tuesday. Follow that vehicle, Cabby. I beg your pardon. I'm trying to get to a job interview. Well, I'm sorry, but your little job interview is going to have to wait. Step on it, Cabby. There's a war on, you know, and we all have a part to play. Daisy? Jill? Jill Trent, goodness gracious, how are you? Can't you go into the actual driver? I'm trying, lady. Believe me, I'm trying. Hand me your radio handset, okay? Here you go. Central Dispatch informed the Metropolitan Police that Jill Trent is in pursuit of two suspected criminals in a brown Studebaker sedan heading north on 4th Avenue between Madison and Carnegie. They're armed and dangerous. Roger that, Jill Trent. <laughs> a cop? Well, not exactly, but the cops will be helpful. Here, have a look. It's bloody. Hey, wait a minute. Invisible ink? If only I had a few drops of lemon juice, I can make out what it says. I see you haven't lost your science, Marks. Holy smokes. Jill Trent Science News Private Eye? I thought for sure you'd be department chair at university by now. Well, actually, I was, until a couple years ago. But, like I said, there's a war on. Everybody's got a role to play. And your role is solving mysteries and fighting crime using the most scientific techniques. And if I find a couple of bad guys like those two in my line of work, I make that my job as well to track them down and bring them to justice. job interview. Let me guess. Head scientist at an important laboratory. Well, not exactly. It's for a secretarial position. Well, stenographer is more like it. Although one day I hope to acquire the full array of skills necessary to be a secretary. <laughs> what is it? Traffic ahead. And now they're driving on the sidewalk. Can't you get out there and follow them? What do you want from me, lady? They just shot out one of my front tires. <laughs> you still have three good tires, don't you? Quit your belly aching and drive like you mean it, okay? Oh, for Pete's sake. Oh, we're closing in on him. Oh, hooray! Hooray! Ah! <laughs> they got away from us, Daisy. Just as we were closing in on them. Yes, I saw. How terrible. It's fine. The cops will nab them. And if not, we'll get him a bunch. You can last off your driver. How much do I owe you? Uh, $1.20 on Lamita, and I'm going to need a new tire. Thanks, lady. And good luck on your job interview, honey. Bigly Badly Ugly is just across the street. Oh my, it is. And with ten minutes to spare.
spare. Jill Trent, you certainly seem to be leading an exciting life and putting your science books to good use, I see. That? That's nothing. Just wait until you see the science lab in my private eye office. Well, golly, I'd love to. Jill? What is it? I was just thinking. If we had tagged that car with a radioactive isotope, say, atomically charged chewing gum propelled from, let's say, a dart gun with a half-life of, say, a day or two, then wherever it went, every official Geiger counter in the city would go off, and we could have followed them to the ringleader and nabbed them all. It was just a thought. Probably not a very good one. Daisy, it was brilliant. When I graduated a year ahead of you, I thought for sure that you would be on your way to a Nobel Prize by now. Whatever happened to your scientific dream? Professor Hoffmeister happened. Oscar Meyer. <laughs> I've always despised that creep. He never stopped picking on me, tearing my work apart. You have no aptitude for science. No aptitude for science. He was jealous at all. Leave the university now and quit wasting your time and mine, is what he said to me. So you dropped that. Well, I couldn't take the constant pressure. I never got that degree that I worked so hard for. Let me tell you something, Daisy. When you're doing something new or revolutionary, that's when all of the bullies and critics and doubters emerge, trying to tear you down. You can't let them. You can't let them write the story of your life. If you had been there with me, you might have convinced me to stand up to Dr. Hoffmeister and stay. But you had gone off into the world. And now it's too late. What do you mean it's too late? Daisy, join me in my work. Be my partner. Your partner? Are you serious? I've never been more serious. Think about it. The two of us forging new scientific discoveries and inventions. There's so many bad guys in this world. Maybe we could take a few of them down. Jill Trent Science Loop and Daisy Smith Certified Scientific Genius. If we put our heads together, there's nothing we can't do. And when this war is over, I'll see to it that you're enrolled in college at any university you choose. You do that for me. Of course I will. Oh my. <laughs> you can do great things, Daisy. Make the world a safer place and live your dreams. Live my dreams? I just don't know. Perhaps Professor Hoffmeister did me a favor when he told me to drop out. Because maybe I'm just not cut out for that kind of world anymore. The doggy dog world of science. And as for the kind of work that you appear to be doing, let me show you something. This is Brad. Brad, huh? <laughs> He's pretty good looking. Oh, yes, he is. He's my fiance. He's over there now. We're going to get married when he comes home, buy a home, and start a family. That's my dream now, and it's more than enough for me. You will come by my science lab sometime, though, won't you? Of course. I'll call you soon. Good luck on your interview. That night, Daisy pens a letter to her beloved Bo. Dear Brad, nothing too exciting to report about here, but you'll never guess who I shared a taxi ride with today while I was on my way to a job interview. My best friend in science college, Jill Trent. We had so much fun catching up on each other's lives that the time just seemed to fly by. Well, I should hear about that steno job soon. Do stay safe, my brave, valiant Brad. Your loving, Daisy. Jill Trent's latest invention gets her into heavy trouble this time, and then gets her right back out again. Let's see what happens next in another round of Slam Bang Sleuthing in the episode of The Black Sheep Murder. But first, friends, after a long day of chasing violators, or just gather around the dinner table with friends and family, do as Jill and Daisy do, and reach for a Chesterfield. The fresher, cleaner, milder cigarette, and simply the most satisfying smoke you could find. Chesterfield cigarettes. Blow some smoke my way. It all started on a warm summer evening. 
Jill had just finished showing Daisy around the science lab when they decided to get some fresh air. So the element detector is still eluding me. The nut that I have been trying to crack for years. You and many of the world's most brilliant scientists. Chesterfield, Daisy? Sure!
Okay, get lost. Now, how about this character? We picked him up just a block away from the crime scene. This one bears some resemblance to the man that we saw, but I can't be sure. He does look similar yet. No, no! Jack didn't kill my mother. Who the heck are you? I'm Luke Van Doren. And Jack Benson here is my fiance. Fiance? Huh? How long have the two of you been engaged? For three years. Three years? <laughs> three years, four months, and twelve days. But Mrs. Van Doren called me a fortune hunter. Said I'd never marry her daughter as long as she lived. I guess that makes me a likely suspect. Uh, <laughs> I suppose it does. Where were you at the time of the murder? Uh, I was in the Museum of Science till about uh, 7.15. But uh, I didn't talk to anybody there, so I don't know how I can prove it. You're certainly not making a very good case for yourself. How do you know it was 7.15 when you left the museum? I, I must have checked my watch. Uh, hey, uh, that's funny. I, I can't find my watch. I, I, I must have lost it someplace. Look, that's this <laughs> way. Yeah. In fact, it's so hysterical that we're going to lock you up for suspicion of murder. Benson, you had the motive. You were at least a... Uh, Partially ID by eyewitnesses, and you have no alibi for your whereabouts at the time of the murder. Maybe you'll want to make this all a whole lot easier and confess now. Well, Jack, oh, it's all right, Tunican, so I'm sure everything will sort out in due time. Don't be so sure. Come along now, you, this way. Jack, Jack. It's hard for me to believe that Jack Benson is the killer. If he had killed Mrs. Van Doren, would he have stopped at a diner a block away? You'd think you'd want to get as far away as possible. My thoughts exactly. I already feel that there's something bigger going on here, and our frustrated fiance got caught in the middle of it. He's innocent. Jack doesn't care at all about my money. You've got to believe me. Mrs. Van Doren, we are not the police, but we may be able to help. We were told that your mother had very many fine jewels. Where did she keep them? In safes, in various locations all across the city. Mother's fortunes were always considerable. She said that criminal organizations and even foreign governments without any means to locate them. And that's best for me to not know. So what would use the secret I understand? I can contact her attorney in the morning. There may not be enough time for that. Thank you, though. at the city morgue. I have a hunch that the key to this mystery lies in the ruby ring on Mrs. Van Doren's hand. But now that Jack Benson appears to have an alibi, can't we simply pass the information along to the police and call it a day? Not until we get to the potty place. What's wrong, Daisy? You never snuck into a morgue before? Why? <laughs> I've never even jaywalked. You go stand by that ladder over there and check out the window and make sure that nobody's sneaking up on us. Uh, Jill? I forgot that you were afraid of heights. Terribly. How do you manage working on the 29th floor of the gridiron? Oh, fortunately, I'm in the middle of a center pole, a half mile away from any windows. <laughs> <laughs> this is her. This is the ring. Magno Exciter Chamber. That should be enough time. Now for the pulsatile element detector ray gun. But first, the protective goggles. Don't want to forget those. <laughs> Exactly 11 seconds. Aluminum is the 
most important element in Ruby, so it should contain a lot of it. Daisy, do you see what I see? There, in the spectrographic projection. A minuscule amount of aluminum. It's mostly room air. So the ruby is hollow. That's all I wanted to know. Thanks. Who? Who are you? You're the man we saw standing beside Mrs. Van Doren's body on the street. And you're not Jack Benson. You're right. I'm Arthur Benson, Jack's brother. And since you'll never have a chance to spill the beans, I'll tell you that I killed Mrs. Van Doren because she put up a fight when I held her up and tried to search her for the map showing where the safes are hidden. How did you know about that? We were told it was a secret. I was once her chauffeur. I overheard her mention it to her daughter. That was before she fired me. She learned I had a criminal record. I'm beginning to understand. You being Jack Benson's brother is probably the real reason she objected to Jack's son-in-law. Because we're the black sheep of the family. Yeah, but she was wrong there. Jack's always been the black sheep of the family. A real goody two-shoes. Everyone else, a hardened career criminal just like me. Even <laughs> Grandma Nelly, may she rest in peace. Oh, I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> now I'll just take that ring. If the, rock, if the rock is hollow, the map combinations must be inside. Even if it is, how do you plan on pawning millions of dollars worth of jewels without attracting suspicion? That's not my problem. All I gotta do is hand the map over to the ringleader of this heist, and I get a one-way ticket to a beach resort in South America. I'll be living on easy street for life. Who's your ringleader? Why should I tell you? I told you too much, in fact. So I'm afraid I'm gonna have to plug you. What if we can make it worth your while not to kill us? You saw what an element detector can do. You could do the same thing with safes or bank vaults. Determine whether or not there's money inside of them before going through the trouble of blowing them up. We'll give it to you free of charge and show you how it works in exchange for our lives. You show me how it works and then I'll make up my mind. Okay. Go ahead, Daisy. Show them how it works. Yes, of course. Well, first, we turn it on. Ah! Hey! Yippee! Oops, I guess we forgot to give you the protective goggles. How careless of us. <laughs> Oh, 
Jill, tomorrow's Monday, and this working girl has to be up bright and early. Rain check. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Night, Jill. Night, Daisy. Jill and Daisy match their investigative science against another extraordinary criminal in our next episode. Watch for it. But first, the next morning. Hello? Miss Trent, uh, Sergeant Mulligan here. What is it, Sergeant? You know that map of all of Mrs. Van Doren's diamonds and jewels? What about it? Well, somebody uh, stuck into the break room last night and took pictures of it. The break room, you say? There were flash bulbs all over the floor under the staff bulletin board. <laughs> the staff bulletin board? In the break room? Oh, it gets so much worse. Every last safe has been cleaned out. Every time with a jewel. They did a very thorough job. Very professional. Professionalism. That's something you don't see every day. <laughs> you can say that again, Miss Trent. <laughs> you do realize that a hostile foreign government could very possibly be behind this paper. Like, I don't know. The one in Germany? The one in Germany? You mean the Germans? Yeah. <laughs> That's the one. Oh. Well, uh, so long, Miss Trent. Uh, nice. Uh, Bubble trouble and tricksy can cause an awful lot of grief. If you doubt it, find out what happens next in another round of slam bang smoothie. But first, friends, here's a habit you will never want to break. Triple mint gum. Why is that? Well, let's start with its delicious taste. Not to mention whiter teeth, better checkups, and healthier, and it aids in digestion as well. In fact, in a certain scientific survey, four out of five dentists recommend triple mint gum for their patients who choose to chew gum. So whether in between meals, on the run, or listen to your favorite show on the radio, do as Jill and Daisy do and chew triple mint gum. Triple mint. It's the chew that satisfies. One Saturday morning at Jill Trent Science Laboratory. I'm sure she'll be the perfect little angel. Of course, I'm tickled to have her. And here's a little money in case the ice cream truck comes by. Five dollars! We can buy out the whole truck with five dollars! Ooh, okay! Yeah, be good now, don't get into any trouble. What you doing? I want to know what you doing! We're experimenting with isolated phosphate of sarogarite, Trixie. Ooh, 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 what's that? <gasps>
<laughs> Do you have any idea how we could catch these racketeers? Well, when I want a few boxes, I put this sign in the window. I leave an envelope of cash under the doorman. Car makes a delivery late at night. Zooms in and out, just like that. If it moves so fast, you don't have much chance of catching them. No wonder there's a gun shortage in the armed forces. There's too much profit to be made by extorting six-year-olds! Hey! Watch your mouth, lady! I'm seven! <laughs> the point is, <laughs> the army's no longer, no, no longer including gum in the boys' meal rations. That says morale is terrible as a result. Tonight, I want you to put the sign out and put the cash under the door like usual. But instead, I want you to include this $5 bill in the cash. It's marked with iodinated phosphite, Mr. Rogeray. Sarah who? Just do as I say. We'll be waiting in the alley across the street, and with any luck, we'll catch these black market profiteers and bring them to justice. That evening, Jill and Daisy persuade Trixie to go to bed. Tonight. You can't go up and catch the bad guys without me. That's against the law. Besides which, it was my $5 bill that you gave away. It'll just be for an hour or two, and we'll replace the five spot with a brand new one. You better! But I want to catch the, uh, the musketeers! Look, Trixie, <laughs> wouldn't it be great if you and all the other kids could get triple my gum for a penny again? Well, sure! Well, then you need to go to sleep. No! <laughs> I'm sorry, Trixie, but you're, you're just going to have to go to sleep. No, 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 no! I demand to speak to my attorney! <laughs> oh, I'm going to get an elephant and a tiger and a rocket ship and knock your whole house down! <laughs> <laughs> 20 minutes later. Nylons, ties, cotton goods, 
I thought this would be a good outfit to work for. Skip the cognac, David. What are you nosing around for, huh? A job, pal. Don't you think if I had anything else in mind, I would have tipped off the fence? Maybe. I suppose you got an angle figure out of you, huh? A natural. Now look, 10 to 1 <laughs> is just a small spoke in a much larger operation. Why not be smart about it and do a little side business? Side business? Of course. Skim off a portion of these nylons and sell them for five bucks with an extra stick of gum to take home to the kiddies. Chances are, your boss won't even notice. That's brilliant, boss. Maybe we should pick here. Ah, hire a pair of smart chicks in this outfit. How about a little retainer? Say, uh, 100 bucks, just to keep the ideas flowing. Make it 500 and you've got a deal. Oh, just you wait until I tell my mother about this. I knew you were real detectives. What? What is this? Tell me, kid. Ah, no! Detectives, huh? I knew there's something phony about this. Oh, Trixie, did you mess things up? Hey, how did you get in the car, kid? Answer me. Ah, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, Let's yeah. keep things coming. By go. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> this test is now a hostage. Put your guns down and slide them over here and nobody gets hurt. Don't do it to Trent. Daisy. And one for the kid here. I'd love to vote these. <laughs> What's our next move, boss? Our next move is to hightail down here before the cops and the FBI arrives. So the cops are not going to be happy when he finds out. We, our operation was turned upside down by a couple of dings. Yeah? Well, maybe we don't stick around long enough for the professor to find out. Maybe we take the proceeds from this week's shenanigans and we get on the first boat to, uh, Venezuela, huh? Huh? Yeah, maybe I'll be joining you. Oh, me too. Take a little breath. Oh, shucks. See you around, chicks. Don't count on it, buster! <laughs> Wait, you guys forgot your money. Oh. Thanks, I owe you one, doll. Chill, what in the world? That loop is still sending out radio waves. I'll tip off the feds, and by it, with any luck, we can track down these characters. It makes me mad to see them get away with this racket for so long. To think of our boys over there going without good old-fashioned American chewing gum to remind them of home. Chewing gum? To think of the nine months that I haven't been wearing for five years. To think of the gum I could have been chewing. It just isn't fair. The next morning at Jill's lab, In this? Black market operation <laughs> uncovered by Lady Gumshoes, but thieves escape police track. What a shame! It's okay. Maybe that Mark Phil will show up somewhere else. You never know when a case like this one will give you the one vital piece of evidence you need to crack an even, per uh, an even larger case down the road. Here comes your mother, Trixie, and right on time, Pythus. And let's just hope that your mom does not read the daily. I told you, she said the only thing that rag's good for is for rabbit fish. <laughs> now remember what we agreed to. No word about the bubblegum papers to anyone if you want to keep this pack up. And if you want to help us out on another case. What do you think I am? Some kind of rotten fish? When I make a deal, it's a deal. <laughs> there you are. Thank you so much for watching Trixie over the weekend. It was no problem. She was no trouble at all. <laughs> Did you miss me, darling? Oh, I missed you something terrible. But maybe next time you leave me with Jill Trent, uh, you can stay away a little longer. Like a month or two. Oh, no. <laughs> we'll see about that. For another uproarious adventure, look for Jill Trent in our next issue. But first, Let's share a quiet moment with Miss Daisy tenderly pens a letter to her far flung soldier, Brad. Dear Brad, not much new to report on the home front. I'm enjoying my new stenography job and just got 15 cents per hour raise. Rather than spend it on something silly, I'm going to save my money to buy another $25 U.S. war bond. I read in the paper that the Army will soon be putting chewing gum in your meal rations again. It seems there was a temporary disruption in the supply of gum. 
I don't know any of the details, but hopefully that's a little ray of sunshine in your day, wherever you may be. Stay well and safe, my valiant, courageous Brad. Your Daisy. Can a man be brutally murdered without ever being touched? Can a magazine advertisement lead to a string of unexplained deaths? These are actual problems that face Jill Trent and her accidental sidekick, Daisy Smith, in our latest scientific crime case, the mysterious spine-tingling case of the sanitary murders. <laughs> the mystery deepens. Oh, five murders to date, sir. And no one has even the slightest suspicion. <laughs> Your victims have willed everything they own to the charities you control. The entire world thinks you're wonderful! <laughs> <laughs> I am wonderful, Otto. I am. Oh, but it can be a dangerous business, sir. But you've managed to keep your hands very clean. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I have. Take a look at this baby powder advertisement. It was, in fact, the inspiration behind my brilliant scheme. Completely sanitary, untouched by human hands? Oh, indeed, sir. My so-called charities have not only made me rich beyond my wildest dreams, but they've also allowed me to make a substantial contribution to the Nazi war efforts. Now, in my view, Otto, in the view of many experts, the victory in this war will go to the first side who is able to find a substantial quarry of Blastonium. An extremely rare element, sir, but one with terrifying explosive powers in <laughs> One difficult of which can level a medium-sized city. Oh, indeed, sir. So you see why every dollar directed to the German war machine is of paramount importance. But enough exposition for the moment. I think it would be a good time to call John D. Rockabye back. Oh, very well, sir. He, he seemed to be a decent sort, wouldn't uh, you say, uh, sir? Uh, yes, nice fellow. Let's see if he's in. Little does Dr. Reiner know that Mrs. Gilmore, a lonely wid widow in the apartment building across the alley, is listening in on the conversation to a party line. John D. Rockabye, please. Yes, I'll wait. Uh, no doubt that the, uh, the fear will be most impressed by your generosity, sir. Eh? Oh, yes. Professor Hoffmeister has been keeping close tabs on my contributions which I only hope will help overthrow the communist Roosevelt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, I don't agree with Mr. Hitler on every issue, mind you, but... No, 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 I don't know, like, the, what, yeah. it, it's just like, it's, it's a little extreme, that's, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I get where you're coming from, though, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rockabye, this is Dr. Reiner. Yes? The document you signed, leaving your entire estate to my charities for crippled war orphans upon your death? Oh, yeah, yeah, so what, what about it? I'm afraid you neglected to initial page four. Oh, I see. Would you mind terribly coming over tonight to take care of this? Tonight? I, uh... For the sake of the children, you know. <laughs> I suppose. For the sake of the children. Come along, please. Will do. See you soon, Doctor. Meanwhile, at Jill Trent Science Lab, Jill and Daisy, hard at work on a new scientific project, are taking a much needed oval team break. Have you seen this? The mystery deepens. Yes. Five nationally known wealthy businessmen found dead in their cars at various locations around the city, apparently with no fingerprints or usable evidence at any of the scenes. The doctors say they all appear to die of natural causes. Quite a coincidence, wouldn't you say? That's no coincidence, if you ask me. Maybe that's why Sergeant Morgan wants to meet with you tomorrow afternoon. To help develop some new leads? I doubt it. As far as the police are concerned, I'm just another meddling girl amateur. Let's just get back. This way, sir. This way. May I take your coat, sir? Oh, uh, 
you have the documents for me, Initial? I only have a moment. Oh, hello, Rockabye. Yes, I have them right here. This won't take long at all. Please, use this pen instead. Okay, you can use this. Doctor, it appears that my initials have already been signed, Doctor. Oh, yes, it has. My mistake. <laughs> Place the pen carefully back in the fish tank, Otto. Very well, sir. Shall I contact Dr. Hopmeister's <laughs> 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 office to, dis to arrange for the disposal of the remains, sir? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Put the body behind the steering wheel of his car. Tow the car to a different part of the city, ever untouched by human hands. Ah! 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 Dr. Hoffmeister's service, or towing service, I should say, is quite professional. Top shelf. <laughs> <laughs> for instance, here's another hundred thousand dollars for Dr. Hoffmeister for the advancement of the Third Lord. Hey, hit that sir! <laughs> the next day at Municipal Police Headquarters. So let me get this straight. You were sitting around, minding your own business, when you had a sudden burning desire to call your cousin in Omaha. And when you picked up the phone, you heard your neighbor Dr. to right or on the line? It's a party line, officer. And how do you know it was Dr. Ryder? Because I can see him through the window. He lives in an apartment building right next month. You're supposed to hang up if someone else is using the line. Didn't you know that? It's called eavesdropping, which is a criminal offense. What do you expect me to do in the evening? There's no one to talk to since Harold's been gone. Other than my parent, he's even worse than Harold. He keeps repeating the same thing over and over. Miss Trace, be right with you. All right. Now, back to your um, accidentally overheard conversation. You claim that Dr. Ryder asked John D. Rockabye to come over? First, he was going on on him, my Hitler. Hitler? Yes, Adolf Hitler. Then when Do Mr. Rockabye got on the line, Dr. Ryder told him to come over. Right away, alone, he said. And when I saw in the newspaper that they found Mr. Rockabye's body in his car on the other side of town, I thought I should let you know. Mrs. Gilmore, Mr. Rockabye was the unfortunate victim of a heart attack. And Dr. Ryder is a world-famous, um, ich, uh, ich, uh, fish scientist, <laughs> a great philanthropist, and one of the most respected men in the city. Now, I suggest you quit snooping in on people's private conversations and find yourself another hobby. Well, you've got such a vivid imagination, why not you draw up a comic strip? Oh dear. Well, thank you. I'll help you at least file a report. Oh, yeah, we'll file a report. Goodbye, Mrs. Gilmore. Sergeant, you're really not going to follow up on that? That could be an important lead. Ah, that ain't a lead. That's just a bunch of fantastical nonsense. But that makes six wealthy businessmen dying of heart attacks in their car. So what do you want me to do about it? I know you may not examine Mr. Rockabye's body. We're crying out loud, Sergeant. I you girls always have to make everything so complicated. Speaking of which, the reason I called you in, uh, this here uh, newfangled static electricity squirt gun you wanted us to try out? Excuse me, Sergeant, but it's not some gas. Yeah, well, whatever it is, you can have it back. This squirt gun, as you call it, contains a powerful miniature magnet and when you activate it and aim it at a person or object, each of its atoms takes on a phosphorescence. Even in the... Too many syllables, girls, please! <laughs> Have you at least <laughs> tried it out in the field? The captain took one look at it and said you should send it to Milton Bradley. I beg your pardon, a toy company... It's okay, Daisy. Some of our inventions are just a little ahead of their time. If you'll excuse me, ladies, I've got bigger fish to fry. I don't know why we even bothered with those dummies. What is it, Daisy? Why so quiet all of a sudden? Bigger fish fry, he said. It's just an expression. Mm -hmm. Yes, but if you're going to kill someone off with a powerful poison that would be virtually undetectable by normal laboratory testing, what would you use? I'm 
thinking, not cyanide. Think in advanced zoology, ichthyology to be specific, which happens to be Dr. Reiner's field of expertise. Fish. Fish. The pink Pekingese pufferfish, seductively beautiful in appearance, but mere contact with its poison causes instantaneous death. You might be honest. I think we ought to pay a visit to our local exotic pet and fish shops. But first, let us find a picture of our dear friend, Dr. Reiner. are correct. He met his demise by the poison of a pot of pink Pekingese pufferfish. So, the reading by the poisonometer will still be sky high on his fingertips. Stop what you're doing right now and put your hands up. How did you know I'd be here, Reiner? Sergeant Mulligan let slip that a nosy P.I. and a bubble-headed sidekick who was following a few breadcrumbs that seemed to lead to me. We both shared a good laugh about it. Preposterous, we both agreed. Simply preposterous. You can kill me, but you'll never get away with this, Reiner. There's a trail of evidence a mile long that leads right to you. The overheard phone call, the fish shop. Oh, yes, there is all that. But I do know how to cover my tracks. Poor Mrs. Gilmore and Chuck from Chuck's Rare Fish and Birds. They won't say another word, not in this lifetime at least. So no break. You're all out of moves, Jill Trent. No more cards to play. Don't be so sure about that, Dr. Reiner. Greetings from a bubble-headed sidekick. What is this? What are you to me? You can't see us, Dr. Reiner, but we're seeing you just fine. For I just blasted you with our thermomagnetic ray gun. Not only are you glowing in the dark, but you're also conducting enough static electricity to power a small city. Ah! I wouldn't touch that gurney again if I were you. Or anything else for that matter. Where the devil are you? Oh, didn't I also tell you that I have an advanced degree in ventriloquy and I can also throw my goose across the room?
Dr. Mulligan's space. When we reel this world renowned shark back into the police headquarters, you're about to be a, a big fish in a much smaller pond, Dr. Reiner. Federal prison. Later at police headquarters. Here's your sanitary murderer, Sergeant. Each victim's body is untouched by human hands, but instead met their demise by a pod of pink Pekingese puppers. I'm a reasonable man, Sergeant. I'm willing to strike a deal. What kind of deal? I have valuable information about a German spy ring operating in this very city. <laughs> spy ring? <laughs> Your, your loyalty to the Nazis doesn't run very deep, Dr. Reiner. Tell us more. Well, the operation is run, under, run by none other than Dr. Oscar Meyer Hoffmeister. Oh! <laughs> Daisy, are you all right? I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> Hoffmeister? <laughs> is this some kind of fish story in this center or what? I guess we'll find out soon enough. But in the meantime, I suggest that you search Dr. Reiner's premises and bring his butler in for questioning as well and tell your men to stay clear of the fish tank. Now get talk to, talking, Dr. Reiner. Where can we find it? Mr. Hoffmeister. Well, there's... Wait. I'm not saying another word until I get a deal in writing from the FBI. Oh, you'll get a deal all right. Lock him up in the most secure cell you've got, Sergeant. It's not too much to ask. All right, you walking Christmas tree. Let me get you acquainted with your new accommodations. Just, just don't forget to feed the fish. One shake a day. That's all they need. <laughs> Are you all right, Daisy? I'm, I'm fine. Um, I have to leave. I, I have an appointment. What about tomorrow? I'm busy tomorrow. And on the weekend, and the weekend after that. I'll see you around. Daisy. The next morning at Jill's lab. The spider at the center of this web, peering out from a secret penthouse on the top floor of the Gridiron Building, in the company of Jill Transformer classmates, Four Eyes McGee and Joey the Weasel. Are you quite sure that Ryder mentioned the name Jill Trent, Mr. Weasel? Sure, I'm sure. How did I forget that name? The insufferable smarty pants of class of 38. About the last thing he said to me before I delivered my milk tray to him, huh? You know, <laughs> the pink pig in these pufferfish is perfectly safe to eat. If you know how to prepare it right. <laughs> it's a delicacy in certain parts of the world. <laughs> I'll make 
to do to it, Mr. McGee. Want me to take care of Trent? It'd be an easy job. She's right enough. No, 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 Mr. Weasel. I knew it would only be a matter of time before she'd be on my trail. As long as we stay one step ahead of her, we have nothing to fear. Would you deny me the pleasure of the game of watching that Strident Scientific Strider try and fail to stop the destruction of the United States of America? No! I didn't think so. Let us play out this little game until its final apocalyptic conclusion. Speaking of which, I have an important mission for the two of you. The Third Reich is urgently requesting a powder pure... Kripa. <laughs> Uh, you want me to run down to Cat Philly? Best Jewish food in town! Oh, no, I think Solomon's is better. I mean, the pickles are far superior. I'm not talking about pickles or dumplings. Kripak! Don't you remember? It's the code word we're using. Oh, yeah! For the bewitchingly rare and highly explosive element of Estonia! One thimbleful of which can level a city the size of, um, Cleveland! <laughs> I'm sending you two out west to the little Colorado town of Los Cedros. Our sources report you may be able to find Kriplock in the nearby mountains. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the other side of town, a very different conversation is unfolding. Daisy Smith, having practically swooned at the mere mention of Professor Hoffmeister's name, made up her mind that she'd keep a safe distance from Jill Trent's science lab and her scientific adventure. But let's see what happens when Jill rings her up. Just a little vacation is all. Sunshine, fresh air, and you'll be able to meet my Uncle Ned. Just a vacation, you say? A vacation out west. No crime fighting or private investigating or anything of the sort. Nothing of the sort. Except maybe a little amateur geology. But just for fun. You can bring along your transistorized atomic automaton. What better place to try it out than in the Rocky Mountains? Los Sejos is the cutest little western town. Well, I am off next week. And to get out of the hustle and bustle of the city does sound pretty tempting. Oh, Daisy, you're going to love it. Pack your bags and meet me at the train station. The tickets are on me. Now let's see what happens when men with guns are matched against real courage and scientific skills in the case of the Blastonium Claim Jumpers. What a quaint little town. This looks like the perfect place to relax. Thank you, Jill. This is just what I needed. I can't wait to introduce you to my dear Uncle Ned. Who prospect are you telling me about? He is the best hunter and guide in all of Colorado. He could probably find us a couple of cougars. Oh, I only hope a cougar doesn't find us first. Can I help you, lady? <laughs> yes, I have a reservation under the name of Trent. Oh, yes, yes, please sign here. You're in uh, the VIC room on the second floor. A uh, very important combo. What made you guys go to Colorado? Blue skies, fresh mountain air. Oh, Beautiful. well, I don't expect you to be disappointed then. <laughs> I know the birds will be so bad, Mary. Especially the couple of chicks having that around. I'll get that means for the birds to then we can introduce ourselves. I think there's something wrong with these cowboy cats. Maybe I should have gone a different size. There's nothing wrong with them, you boy cat. The French goes on the outside, not on the inside. Ain't you ever seen a Western? Jail Trent. Jumping, Jim and Gale. You get prettier every year. Uncle Ned, it's so good to see you. How's Aunt Gertrude? Ornery as ever. I'd like to introduce you to my friend that I've been writing you about. This is Miss Daisy Smith. Pleased to meet you, Daisy. Is this your first time out west? Yes, it is. Have you been doing any hunting lately, Uncle Ned? My prospecting has kept me a much too busy for all that, Jill. Jill Trent, she's the sleepy girl P.I. who sent my brother homeward to the pen. I bring a crummy place like this for a vacation. Beats me, but I'd like to even things up. Let's listen in for a while and see what they're up to, and then we'll settle the score. Heavens, Uncle Ned. Don't tell me you finally found gold. Gold? I'd rather not say, Jill, until we're out there. It's such a wild and strike. 
It's all I can do to keep the news from spreading. Of course, I don't rightly know how pure it is. Not until I take a few samples to Denver. Oh, good heavens! You don't need to do that. It just so happens that your brilliant niece asked me to bring along my transistorized atomic automaton. Your what? Oh, just a little invention of mine. We thought we'd just have some fun with it, but this machine can isolate, scientifically extract, and tell you in a heartbeat exactly how much of any given mineral is in a given sample of ore. Well, I'll be a three-legged sloth, breaking you like a ride up to Cooper Creek in the morning. Let's go. Plastonium, man. Mmm, <laughs> this is getting better all the time. That whatever that old coot's down needs more dough for us. Not yet. 
Not until we make them tell us we're the best Watsonian to pop us off. Maybe then I'll let you party. Or better yet, we'll march them into this mine and dynamite the heck out of this map. Hey, you know, everyone! Oh. Well, this is awkward. <laughs> advertised, 
or you can spring into action right away. How you ask? With your own personal sand blaster by Casbro. Just load it up with ordinary beach sand and fire away. In most cases, the blindness is temporary, but the satisfaction you'll get from wiping that smile off that perp's face will last a lifetime. It's the Miniature Sand Blaster by Casbro Novelty Company. It's Jill and Daisy's choice for personal recreational protection. Dear Brad, I'm feeling a little blue this week, if truth be told, about another girl, a girl I used to know at school. I thought sometimes that we were as close as twins, but as it turns out, it was just a mirage. You can do great things, Daisy. Make the world safer and live your dreams. The mystery deepens. You can kill me, but you'll never get away with this, Reiner. There's a trail of evidence a mile long that leads right to you. You want to know the strangest thing? If you had asked me, I would have said yes. Yes to everything. It's not necessarily a lost cause. You never know when a case like this one will give you the one vital piece of, of evidence that you need that cracks an even more important case down the line. Hey kids, follow the crazy maze on this map to the treasure chest and good luck. There's something printed on the treasure chest, I think. Very tiny print. 32 grit iron. The 32nd floor of the grit iron building. Come on, Jill, pick up the phone, please pick up. We complete each other's sentences, Daisy. Finish each other's thoughts. Always have and always will. Don't you see that? Jill's on her way there now. I just know she is. And she could be in great danger. Meanwhile, 32 stories above the city, the pompous pontificator, Professor Oscar Meyer Hoffmeister, emboldened and, en and enriched by his recent capers, pays off his co-conspirators as he prepares to put into motion his overarching scheme, which is to deliver a fatal blow to U.S. U.S. communications across the country and to allied forces around the globe. Here is the money I promised to you for your labors on behalf of the Third Reich. One million dollars to Four Eyes McGee, the world's foremost radio technician, creator of the Destructomatic Miniature Radio Receiver. Perhaps you can use some of your prize money to purchase yourself a Real pair of glasses, by the way. What's wrong with and that? one million dollars to Joey the Weasel, who managed to implant our destructomatic miniature radio receivers across every official radio in the land. Oh, thank you, boss. I, I'd like to thank my mother and my father, Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Weasel Sr., for always teaching me to dream big and reach for the sky. And last, <laughs> but certainly least, fifty dollars to my personal bodyguard and chief thug, Slim Fatty. <laughs> hey, Walt. I do like to thank my mother, my, my father, and my uncle, and my, my grandpa. And, and, oh, my God. Who is it? That has to be Jill Trent, right on cue and right on time. <laughs>
Think of all the lives that could have been saved. Think of all the lives that could have been saved. Think of all the lives that could have been saved. Got it. Think of all the lives that could have been saved, you idiot! Think of all the lives that could have been saved, idiot. Got it. <laughs> it's open now. Come in. Hoffmeister, you've got a lot of explaining to do, but first, put your hands up. And why would I want to do a ridiculous thing like that? Because you are a disgusting and ger <coughs> and German. <coughs> you were the one behind the Blastonium heist, the sanitary murders, and those brought well, away the lives of one of our most valiant agents. Yes, it's true. All true. Apparently, you're forgetting the case of the bubblegum racketeers. Don't count on it. I never forget. But the most important thing is that I finally tracked you down. As I'm sure you would, Jill Trent. Where else would your brilliantly deductive scientific thinking lead you but to me, the greatest scientific mind of our generation? And I, in turn, deduced that you would be hot on my trail and arriving at this very hour. And so, I set this trap for you. Trap? I don't see a trap. Taxi! Taxi! We're too late. Oh, no, not you again. <laughs> to the gridiron building. I'm the double driver. There's a war on, you know. So what are you up to in this layer of yours, Hoffmeister? What am I up to? Well, that would be this! The Transometron! A gyroscopically powered super transmitter which, when activated with a flip of this switch, will instantly cripple U.S. communications and for months on end, police communications gone, radar gone, radios on every American warship and Coast Guard vessel will cease to function. What better way to prepare for a surprise German invasion? And with the blastonium we've acquired, we will easily subdue the entire free world. I am not going to let you flip that switch. Now, like I said, put your hands up. You thought you could make the world better with science, didn't you? Such a waste, such a pity. I always hated you, Jill Trent, and students like you with stars in their eyes. But teaching at one of the great universities allowed me access to the most devious minds of a generation, and were able to recruit them to our cause. Surely you remember Four Eyes Mickey. We became reacquainted in Colorado. How are we doing, sir? Four Eyes, you lousy rat. Where are you? I'm on your shoe. My shoe? You're not shoe. Just look. By the road, I'm always visiting you, too. Remember when we were back at school and I asked you out to the high rodeo spring fling? Yeah, and I said that I would never go out with you even if you were the last man on earth. Well, however, how do you feel about that magic trick? Changed your mind? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and say hello once more, Joey the Weasel. Of course, Joey the Weasel. The one man who couldn't do an iota of original research in his life and just stole from everyone else. Perhaps. But what if I told you that he's now a millionaire? A millionaire? <laughs> I doubt it. It's true. That's millions with a capital M. Yep, down here, on your right shoe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can't you go any faster, driver? In this traffic, do you want to take the wheel and drive? Yes, actually, I do. But let us forget these minor players, these intellectual midgets, when you and I are <laughs> the greatest science virtuosos the world has ever known. The two of us, and Daisy Smith, that mousy little friend of yours. Why, I think she was even brighter than you, Jill Trent. Then why did you make her quit school? Because I realized if the two of you were ever to collaborate, it would be a formidable and perhaps unstoppable force. For goodness, for democracy and progress, all things I abhor. And so I drove her away. No doubt she's probably a cocktail waitress somewhere, or a stenographer. <laughs> How do 
do you know she's not hot on your trail right now? Well, I don't see her anywhere, do you? I am not having it off my turn. I'm giving you to the count of three to put your hands up before I plug you. One, two... The tragedy of it is, if the excess powers had another scientist of your caliber, this war could have reached its conclusion a lot sooner. Think of all the lives that could have been saved. <laughs> I said, think of all the lives that could have been saved. I said! <laughs> <laughs> oh, how rude of me. I forgot to introduce my trusted bodyguard, Slim Fatty. Tie her up, Mr. Fatty. Goodness gracious. It's a good thing I have my Casper X-ray glasses with me. Two men, and that must be Jill on the floor. I need to get in there right away. But with the door locked, there is only one possible way. A narrow window ledge that goes all the way around the building, 32 stories above city streets. Oh my. Perhaps I'd better take the elevator back down and call the police. But what if they don't believe me? Ah, I see you two are back from your little sabbatical. <laughs> Contact Berlin, Mr. McGee, and tell them that Operation Blackout is about to enter its final countdown. That voice! It's Professor Hoffmeister himself. And me? I'm just Daisy Smith, a college dropout. A total U.S. communications wipeout will begin in exactly five minutes. Five minutes. It sounds as if every second counts. No time to summon help. But the window ledge. And Professor Hoffmeister. We all write our own stories, Hoffmeister. And yours will go down with infamy. Ah, uh, yes. Isn't it wonderful? Write our own stories. She knows I'm here. Hold on, Jill. I'm on my way. We'll return after this brief announcement. But first, friends, did you ever wish you could see through walls? To find out just what that commotion is in the room next door? See through clothing? <laughs> to detect hidden weapons and documents? Arrest violators? Even diagnose and treat broken bones? If so, you'll want the Magnetovision X-ray Spectacles by Casbro Novelty Company. It's Jill and Daisy's first and only choice for X-ray perception. Order now will also rush you a Science Sleuth membership card signed by Jill Trent herself. That's the Magnetovision X-ray Spectacles by Casbro. Has Berlin been contacted, Mr. Wiki? Yes, they send their very best for God. Then let us savor this moment in history. The tide of the war will be turned in two minutes. Oh, no, it won't! Not if I have anything to say about it! Daisy Smith, the shrinking violet of Science University. Don't listen to his taunt, Daisy. Just turn off the machine. You have no aptitude for science and no aptitude for this line of work whatsoever! You, you can't intimidate me, Professor. In fact, you're not my professor at all anymore. You're just a creepy, evil lout who turns out to be a Nazi agent. You're outgunned here, Daisy. Now be a good girl and put the gun down before somebody gets hurt. No, 60 seconds to go, Professor. Excellent! Daisy, if you take one more step towards that machine, we will shoot your friend, Jill Trent. And then, you. Don't worry about me, Daisy. Just turn off the machine. I never thought I'd try this out in the real world without extensive testing, but it sounds as if the fate of the country rests in the balance. I must slow them down now with my thermonuclear time stopper wristwatch. <laughs>
There's been an incident on the 46th floor of the Gridiron Building. I'm going to need an ambulance right away. Well, multiple ambulances, actually. And some of the patrol cars and the feds while you're at it. Jill Trent and Daisy Smith just cracked another case. A short time later, Jill Trent was admitted to the city hospital for medical treatment and placed under observation. The next day, Daisy Smith stopped by to pay her dear friend a timely visit. Knock, knock. Before you say anything, I just want to say that I'm sorry. I'm sorry I lied to you and that I deceived you. And you have every right to be mad at me. You still do. But it won't happen again. Thanks, Joe. I do believe you. Can I ask you something? What is it? How did you... The window ledge confronting Hoffmeister. Well, you were in trouble, Jill. We all were, actually. Well, anyways, that's not what I came here for. I actually wanted to thank you. Thank me? You just saved the world from a German invasion. Not to mention you saved my life. What the heck are you thanking me for? For letting me know that I have the power to write my own story. Well, I hope you also have a decent dress and shoes because we just got invited to the White House. <laughs> they called while I was out. Also, what is it? I'll let you read. Dear Miss Trent, Thank you for writing to us about your friend and colleague, Daisy Smith. On the strength of your endorsement, we would be pleased to offer Ms. Smith a full scholarship and immediate admission to our doctoral program in science, plus a generous stipend. Kindly ask her to contact me directly, etc., etc. Sincerely, Howard Kent, Dean of the College of Science. I hope you don't mind. You should have asked you, Jill. But of course I don't mind! But Jill Trent Science Sleuth. 